we are honored to be joined by Professor Dili Fung, who is Pro Director for Education at the London School of Economics and Political Sciences, or the LSE. The relationship between KFAS and the LSE is strong. KFAS funds a program at the LSE called the Kuwait Program, which is in its 14th year, a program that aims to establish collaborative research partnerships between LSE and Kuwait universities to deliver high quality research on the challenges facing Kuwait, as well as organizing faculty exchange between LSE and Kuwaiti academics to facilitate knowledge, intellectual capacity, and career development. But back to our distinguished guest for this evening, Professor Dili Fung, Pro Director for Education at the LSE, drawing on her interdisciplinary roots in English, uh, philosophy of education and politics, and on her long teaching career, Professor Fung's academic work analyzes connections between research, learning, student agency, policy, and leadership. In her influential and widely cited book, in fact, an open access monograph titled A Connected Curriculum for Higher Education, it's a book which you can download and read for free in the handout section on the right, uh, thanks to Professor Fung and UCL Press. Uh, Professor Fung op opens her book with the question, is it possible to bring university research and student education into a closer, more symbiotic relationship? Professor Fung's talk tonight is about connected learning for a digital age. If you have any questions, please type them using the chat window on the right, and I will do my best to bring them to Professor Fung's attention during the Q&A. And now, without further ado, I present to you Professor Dili Fung. Professor, the floor is yours. Good evening. Good evening to you all, and thank you so much for that kind introduction. It's uh, really a pleasure and an honor to be invited to share some of my thoughts and some of my scholarship with you and with participants this evening and a warm thanks to, to KFAS and, and to yourself for, for inviting me. Um, so, pleasure is ours. Oh, well, thank you so much. I think you'll find, and I, I very much enjoyed the introductory video, and I think you'll find that uh, what I'm going to be talking about today um, shares many of the same interests and goals that that the video uh, highlights um, through KFAS. So it was very interesting for me to see. So we have some slides which I will um, share with you. And uh, I'm happy to talk to you for perhaps half an hour or so um, about my, my work and ideas. And then we will be opening up uh, for questions and discussions. So please do engage, critique, um, add examples or, or questions of any kind. Um, be delighted to be in conversation with you. So I'm going to share with you some really key um, ideas about some of, some of the developments that are going on in universities at the moment and some of the ideas um, and recommendations that have come from my own work, which includes research and it also includes analysis of practice across a number of different fields, um, which, as uh, Yusuf uh, alluded to earlier, um, relate uh, research to education, to public engagement and, and other areas. I'm going to start by talking about some some principles that underpin my work and underpin many of the conversations that are going on about universities at the moment in the crisis that we find ourselves in um, during this uh, global pandemic. And I do wish all of you very good health, I have to say, in this difficult time. But as we revisit the values of a sector, the higher education sector, universities, um, your research uh, institutes and so on, um, actually really thinking through what we're trying to achieve is a, is a key thing to do in any time of crisis. Um, we've been talking at the LSE and more widely across the higher education sector, um, nationally and, and internationally, around some of these big issues. What, how can we affect good learning and promote professional sensibilities and a disposition for critical inquiry within and across uh, traditional disciplines? Can we create an inclusive scholarly academic and professional community both simultaneously in which everyone has a voice and everyone has opportunities to create and produce and lead? 
can we forge better connections um, between uh, education, research, professional practices, um, public stakeholder engagement, so that we can transform individuals, organisations and communities. We know that when we educate an individual, that has much more um, than just impact on that one individual. It has Im lasting impact very often on whole families, on, on generations and on wider communities. So one of the things we do in education, in, in the higher education sector and elsewhere, is to fall back on some of the key principles that, that underpin what we're trying to do. And, and what we're talking about in university uh, learning, or university life, if you like, is learning, we're focusing on learning. So how do we define learning? In broadly speaking, learning is defined as a, a reasonably permanent change in what someone knows and understands and is able to do. So that learning may be in one or more different domains of our of our lives. It may be cognitive in our in our intellectual processes relating to our mental processes of perception, memory, judgment and reasoning. But it may also be and almost certainly will be in some dimensions of our development affective. In other words, relating to our feelings, our motives and our attitudes. There's another domain of, of learning, the psychomotor, to do with physical skills, using equipment, dexterity, and so on. Generally speaking, um, we're mostly co um, concerned with the first two in higher education. Of course, there are some contexts in which the third, third becomes uh, equally important. But how do people learn? Well, of course, we have multiple explanations of how people learn, whether we whether those are psychological or philosophical or sociological. So there's no there's no one set of definitions that we have. Um, all of the definitions we have of learning are tested or scientifically tested, um, are uh, critically analysed and considered in in various contexts. But there is a core principle that I certainly work on uh, and have worked from uh, in my in my uh, roles and before I was at the LSE where I'm responsible for education and the student experience across the whole school, um, I was a professor of higher education at UCL, University College London, um, and it was my uh, academic field there that was that was higher education as, as, a, as a field for research. So that's where some of these um, ideas uh, are coming from. But so here is a core principle that nothing is taught until it's learned and it's the students who do the learning. So traditionally in universities and in, in, in schools of other kinds, we have focused very much on teaching. How do we teach? How do we teach effectively? How do we send those messages in an effective way? But what a lot of the research has shown over the 20th century into the 21st century is that the teaching shouldn't be your key, er your key area for focus, but the learning. How do people learn? And what we have is growing evidence from scientific domains, for example, from Carl Wyman based at Stanford, that active learning is often more effective than passive types of learning where students are listening and, and just absorbing information, as it were. And what we need to be aware of, too, is the importance of social learning and the situated learning theories that have developed over recent decades. Um, because learning is not a solo sport, learning is something that is a collective endeavour and that's why as universities we're looking at how to really build that sense of community. Now taking a philosophical approach, drawing on a uh, philosopher of higher education Ron Barnett, um, we might think about the pedagogies, the ways in which we design our teaching and the ways in which universities orientate themselves. Even in this modern digital age, there are some fundamental, more traditional ideas that we, we want to think about. So we might want to require students to engage with one another in, a, in, a, in an era in which they have respect for others, generosity, a preparedness to listen. We want to think about uh, making explicit the relevant standards for our education. Um, so that students can be careful and show appropriate sort of restraint in their in their learning. Um, this is obviously something that we think about in very specific ways when much learning is now online for, for obvious reasons. Um, you know, how do we actually use our online spaces to make sure that we create those areas of respect? And then Ron Barnett talks about being encouraging. Um, encouraging our students, enthusing our students, giving them a new spirit, 
requiring students to put forward their own profferings or, or what they create and offer to us, if you like, so that they can build courage to take up a position, stake a claim, a knowledge claim, and require students to give of themselves, to be active uh, in the situations in which they find themselves. So some of the work that I've done around the connected curriculum concept, which I'm going to share with you just now, um, really focuses on these connections between learning and research. And so as I, as I put it in, in the book, learning like research is about paying attention to where the edges of knowledge are. And that it's, this is that at, at the core of scholarship, whether it's research as scholarship or whether it's learning uh, and teaching, that we're really helping those who are learning um, to understand where the edges of knowledge are and to really understand how they can seek better knowledge and understanding. Um, drawing on another um, publication that I was involved in on behalf of the League of European Research Universities, we looked at what the benefits were of students of being in a research-rich environment. Uh, environment and we noted that the benefits for students arise from the intellectual depth associated with engaging cutting-edge investigations where the students really connect with research and investigative activity and also the benefits come from the range of skills associated with independent and collaborative inquiry. So what are the challenges that we face at the moment? So teaching online we're dealing with an absence of place often in universities now. Students have been used to being in a particular place on a campus, um, but now they've got this sense of a sort of disparate or, or disaggregated kind of environment that they're occupying. Um, they, uh, you know, it, it's tricky um, to find effective ways of designing online and blended courses that really engage students. Um, we also need to try and ad address inequalities of access to, to learning at the moment um, because we know that students, for example, have unequal access to internet, to um, other kinds of software and other environments in which they can easily learn. And we can, um, we know that students uh, differ in the, in the um, levels of preparedness they have to structure and manage their own work if they're thrown back into their own spaces. Um, and we need also to sustain their motivation and their mental well-being in this world with such limited um, social opportunities. And it's a struggle for, for many of us to, to adapt in the ways that we need to in our local contexts. But there are positives about online and blended education. So Tansy Jessup, another scholar in, in the UK, talks about personalising learning so that students work at their own pace. That, that, that the change to online and blended education, blended meaning some online but some face-to-face, -face, um, uh, is that it can trigger a shift from focusing so much on the content that, of the curricula um, and, and really thinking about the, the um, key learning points and enabling students to get to grips with these, these fundamental concepts that sometimes they lose. And then drawing out different voices, inviting questions from students who don't routinely contribute to discussions. That's been found to happen more online uh, in some contexts than it does in face-to-face -face, um, uh, environments. Prompting student engagement, taking the focus off assessment all of the uh, time where students, students' learning is measured. As important as that is, we need the students to have some space and some flexibility to learn without always being thinking about the tests, as it were. Um, but to promote participation and writing and, and what Tansy Jessup calls an enduring kind of community. So now to share with you my um, just a, a brief overview of the work around the connected curriculum. And I hope you'll feel uh, there's a, a connection here with all of these ideas. So broadly speaking, the connected curriculum is framed in, in this uh, through this kind of model or image at the center of which is a focus on learning through research and inquiry, situating the students as active inquirers rather than just passive receivers of knowledge. Um, and then there are six dimensions. And in the um, book, you'll see a chapter on each of the six dimensions if you're interested in it with examples, real life practice examples of, of what these principles are. But I'm just going to walk you through the principles. So the first one, the first dimension is about connecting students with research and with researchers. Now we know 
that um, well, from our research, we know that uh, when we ask faculty members in universities whether students understand and, and really uh, feel connected with the research that they undertake, the faculty members will often say, yes, of course my students know about the research. Of course they feel connected with the, the latest cutting edge um, investigations that we're doing. But when you ask the students, that's not what the students say. Um, so often we've had students um, as they come to the end, for example, of a bachelor's degree, um, as well as even in, in some postgraduate masters and, and higher degrees, um, where students have not felt that they've had really uh, enough opportunity to connect in with research and researchers. So you'll see uh, through the book, if you're interested in it, a number of different examples of ways in which right from the start of their studies, even in bachelor level degrees, where students can come in, can get together in small groups, can interrogate researchers, can really understand right from the beginning of their studies what researchers are doing, how they're pushing the edges of knowledge, and what that might mean to, uh, around the discipline and the sorts of practices and skills that are needed for research. The second dimension um, is around designing a through line of research and investigation into every degree programme. So there are examples there of uh, whole degree programmes which where there are a sequence of learning opportunities for students through and through a number of years, which builds up their ability to investigate, as I say, even at bachelor's level, um, to investigate and to really work alongside uh, researchers. And there are many different ways in which this can be done. The third dimension is around empowering students to select and combine different disciplinary approaches and thereby uh, solve complex challenges. You'll see that the common ground with all of these areas is about making connections, which we kind of tend to assume these connections are made, but they're often not. So what this dimension does is it really challenges faculty members to think about the, the cross-disciplinary activities. We know that the huge number of extraordinary local and global challenges that we're faced with in the workplace, that governments are faced with, that policymakers are faced with, cannot be solved through one narrow academic disciplinary lens. And many of the, um, of the solutions, the, the real huge steps forward um, are mediated through sort of digital spaces very often, but also occupy um, these connections across different disciplines. And so there are a number of examples there um, where students um, undertake often in interdisciplinary groups, um, very uh, concrete challenges around maybe poverty in their local area, or it may be something to do with, um, with uh, you know, to, to do with sort of ethics or something, uh, as to do with a sort of current question that might be more national or global. There are many uh, examples there. And uh, I think this is an area that we've paid a lot of lip service to in universities, but we've never properly really found a way to build these interdisciplinary connections consistently um, in, in our research uh, rich universities. The next um, dimension is about connecting students, um, enabling students to connect their academic learning with workplace learning. Now there are some in universities that traditionally felt that they shouldn't have to worry too much about workplaces and you know there's a kind of purist notion of knowledge um, that it shouldn't be sort of sullied too much with the with the um, realities of the workload uh, of, of the workplace. I firmly disagree that there is a clash. I think we can be very deeply intellectual and very um, very much committed to the idea of, of the intrinsic worth of knowledge um, and still make really meaningful connections and enable students to make those connections with what uh, with what people are challenged with every day in the workplace and I'd be interested to know uh, from those of you listening in today about the kind of current challenges that you face in in workplaces that you're familiar with and the kinds of knowledge base the skills the attitudes and the and the kind of um, personality traits, if you like, that you want to promote uh, in your own workplaces that you'd like universities to be um, developing. So again, a number of different ways in which, uh, which universities everywhere are beginning to, to do better uh, are illustrated in the book. And then the fifth dimension, which I'll, I'll emphasize in particular because it's one of the most um, uh, transformative and also uh, particularly relates to the issue of a, of a kind of digital age. 
what we've done traditionally in universities is we've asked students to go away and learn things. We've taught them, they've gone away, learned, investigated, re revised, and so on. Often they've taken timed examinations or they've uh, undertaken projects and they've given what they, what they produce, whether that's an examination paper or an essay or a, a project, um, back to the tutors who have taught them um, so that the faculty members uh, who are the ones who are already the experts spend men a many a long hour reading uh, the work of the students and that's quite right of course because they have to make judgments about how uh, how the students are doing and what they've learned and what they've achieved but what this dimension does is it says how can we through our degree programs provide regular opportunities for students not just to produce you know an uh, an essay or, or a, a written project or a timed examination paper but to produce multimedia outputs that speak to specific audiences so that students learn how to how when they engage with science when they engage with new areas of knowledge when they engage with with new uh, approaches to policy they don't just think about that in a, in a kind of academic abstract way but they think about and are, are, uh, are um, enabled and facilitated in such a way that they, they, they do think about and connect with um, external audiences and stakeholders. So that they think, if I am communicating these ideas to this particular audience or this group or these policymakers, um, then how would I communicate? By, by which uh, multimedia methods would I communicate these ideas? And I think it's really key um, that we uh, encourage our students to think about those different modes of communication, creativity, um, ability, of course, to critically examine the kinds of communications that they're faced with every day so that they don't just accept things that they see as face value coming to them through the media, but to be able to produce outputs um, that will persuade and connect and engage others with knowledge, with the cutting edge of knowledge that is informed by the latest research. And again, many examples in the book and happy to answer any questions about um, specifics uh, in that area. And then finally, and, and probably relatively simply, but not something that we've always done well, is really in our enabling students to become an part of an inclusive community of students, alumni, scholars, and professionals. Are we really enabling students to connect with one another, with professionals in the workplace, um, with alumni, some of those will be the same people, of course, um, and uh, building those communities and networks, particularly important uh, for students who come from the kind of family backgrounds where they don't already have strong family connections with a set of opportunities for their future. And then just very briefly, I'm not going to talk about this in any detail, but you can obviously look at it in, in more uh, depth if you wish. Um, this just uh, illustrates um, what we're trying to promote among faculty members to think about those different learning types down the left hand side for students. Um, that it's not just about acquisition of knowledge, it's about investigation, discussion, collaboration, really enabling students to work together collaboratively in groups. There's a lot of examples of, of how that works and why that's effective. Um, practice, putting things into practice and production, as I, as I mentioned before. And I won't talk in any more detail about that, but again, happy to, to talk uh, in more detail if you have any specific questions. And then finally, and very briefly before we go to um, uh, conversation, um, what this has also prompted for us and in many universities in the in the UK and further afield has been revisiting the relationships between different parties as it were within universities as well as uh, between universities and our external um, uh, uh, contacts and collaborators and uh, stakeholders. Um, are there new opportunities to connect and collaborate with students? Can we break down some of the status gaps between roles if students are working alongside researchers, for example, um, uh, more frequently? Can we create more imaginative interactive practices so our younger students with their very creative ideas um, can come in and really enrich research? So this is not just about making education better, it's about making research better. It's about connecting research more fully and in a more current um, and more digitally informed, more multimedia way, um, the, the, the work that's actually been being done uh, by researchers, but using or working with students uh, to help with knowledge exchange, um, public engagement of current ideas and so on. 
that. Um, one of the uh, particular examples around this is something we call Meet the Researcher, where students get together in small groups to meet a researcher, they ask them lots of questions, and then they produce um, an output, a multimedia output of some kind, they have to create it uh, according to their own um, designs, as it were, and um, that will engage an external lay audience or perhaps a particular targeted audience um, with the work of that research. And the students love it, researchers love it as well, because researchers love to talk about their work and they love to see their work getting more widely promoted. And then um, enhanced consultation, really consulting with our students about that using software solutions. Uh, that can give a, more of a voice to students as part of this so they can co-design some of the activities with us and um, really connecting them again with alumni and others through virtual town halls, student panels um, and as I say really co-developing new ideas and solutions to, to move universities, even the traditional research intensive universities like the LSE uh, in very much into 21st century life. Um, one particular example of working with students is something called LSE Changemakers. Again, I just highlight it here for something you might wish to look at, where we um, uh, invite students to pitch for projects that will actually make a change to LSE around education and the student experience. And they do some paid projects, uh, they work in small groups, they, um, they undertake uh, some um, data analysis, a gathering and, and analysis of various sorts, and come back to the school with recommendations. It really situates them as, as sort of proactive developers of LSE and not just as kind of recipients or customers, as it were. And then so my concluding thoughts as we come to our um, discussion. Um, our education sectors and higher education in particular, I've been talking about, that they're full of complex challenges at the moment, multiplied during crisis. And already, as I mentioned, under change during, you know, through the digital age, changing away from some traditional practices and towards uh, some new practices where we think very differently about how we communicate, how students can communicate, how we can create that animated and really engaging um, scholarly community that is properly and deeply connected with external challenges and communities so that universities don't feel as if they're behind a, a sort of private wall somewhere in an elite space, but that local and, and regional and national and international communities can really have much more um, engagement with what's going on within university uh, uh, spaces and be part of it, really part of uh, something new and, and uh, inspiring for everybody involved. It's a good time when we have a challenge to revisit our core values and goals and remind us of what good learning is about, about transformational change, not just about acquiring knowledge. That we can develop local answers, local, local patterns of activity through dialogue and partnership between students and faculty and professional staff and other stakeholders. That we can change practice to help us address pre-existing educational challenges, systemic inequities that we see everywhere, as well as preparing students for changing workplaces, because we know, and I'm sure many of you will see this yourselves, that workplaces do change rapidly and we're not in a state of, you know, very sort of static professional practices, but things are moving forward and we need to prepare our students so that as they go out into the workplace, um, they are prepared for, for um, for the unknown and that's what this is all about inquiring investigating critiquing communicating but always being able to respond to new developments and find solutions for for the current challenges and for the challenges of the future and um, so i hope that my short talk has given you some uh, food for thought and very happy now to come to um, some uh, questions and i'll hand back to um, youssef i i think is going to uh, orchestrate the questions for us and I look forward to hearing your uh, your thoughts and to seeing what uh, has particularly caught your your attention. Thank you Yousef. Thank you very much Professor Fung. A truly interesting presentation. Uh, the, the digital uh, uh, part of it, the challenges uh, we have with the changing uh, modality of uh, presentation. You did mention that students might or students have in fact uh, uh, had to adjust to the uh, change in space. So no longer are they sitting in a built environment. They are now mm. 
bottom line and and all the implications that that, that had there uh, many questions um are really about that transition i suppose in fact there was a question from uh one of our members in the audience i guess i'll tackle that before i go to the other questions that were sent privately and he's asking about accreditation and i guess this question transcends uh the pandemic uh, but accreditation of studying online um particularly for, for graduate uh, studies uh, and uh, Mohammed asks about uh, uh, law or international relations the accreditation yeah. challenge, i wonder if you have an opinion or advice on that challenge Sure, that's a very good, a very good question. And of course, in many professional fields, there will be an external accrediting body, for example, law um, uh, and other areas too. Um, and for quite a number of years, I have to say, uh, I've been involved in higher education for a number of decades. Um, I am actually a grandmother, so I've you know I've been around for a while. Um, and uh, for for a number of years, I have to say, universities have rather taken the the line that the professional accrediting bodies will not have the flexibility or the imagination or the methods, as it were, to understand how to accredit, um, uh, whether it's online learning or these more innovative types of output that students produce rather than the more traditional, uh, you know, perhaps timed examinations or perhaps alongside, I should say, it's not, in, not absolutely a replacement. Um, the truth is, uh, certainly in my experience, and I'm sure it does vary around the world, but uh, often professions do have a very international um, kind of outlook, as it were. Um, it, uh, it's the case that um, accrediting bodies, professional bodies are really stepping up to the plate right now and talking to one another, talking to um, university groups about how they can look in much more um, more generous and inclusive, but, but still professionally appropriate ways at including online learning, um, stackable credentials, um, different ways of, of bringing uh, parts of learning together into whole qualifications um, and also the more innovative ways of actually demonstrating knowledge through different types of assessment modes. And uh, I'm very confident, I, I think we have a little way to go, but there is some shifting already happening. I'm very confident that the professional bodies will in due course, um, uh, and some of them already are, uh, give us much more flexibility. I think one key thing that I'll just mention briefly around this is that what's important for everybody to understand and it isn't sometimes properly understood in my view among faculty members who often are not education experts so it's not a criticism of them at all but that the way in which we we uh, accredit um uh, learning or if you like professionalism in a particular field um is to do with the demonstration of knowledge and skills it isn't really to do with which classroom you've sat in or exactly how long it took you to um, achieve certain area of knowledge, uh, with a few exceptions where there's experience involved, for example, in hospitals or, or so on, um, you know, in, in medicine. Um, but uh, but really it is to do with whether the, the individual person has actually gained the knowledge and skills. And as long as we can find safe and reliable ways of demonstrating that, then there should be much more flexibility uh, for building those, those credentials and the accreditation of, of those degrees. And that, that's in development. Well, thank you. Um, we have uh, another question that I guess transitions into this. Uh, Safa asks about um, engaging students, uh, engaging students in the learning process, again, about online learning uh, versus the standard classroom setting. And, and she's asking if there's um, if online learning makes it easier to disengage. So we're talking about distractions. We're talking about um, missing out on the uh, nonverbal communication, posture, gestures. We're talking about not physically seeing a teacher and um, instructor in front of you. And then there is a the higher risk of um, disengaging and uh, the instructor not being able to no notice that on the spot. Uh, have you any thoughts on this aspect? Yes, thank you. That's another really good question. Um, I. I, I agree that there are some real new challenges for being online. So if you're teaching the whole of your course this year um, uh, through, you know, through an online uh, platform like this one, um, there are certain um, 
disadvantages for sure, and then there are some advantages. So I'll talk about the disadvantages. Um, depending on how you set things up, it may be that you don't get to see your students' faces or you don't get to see all of your faces, or there are issues about whether students keep their cameras on or turn them off. Um, and even with cat with uh, faces on a screen, it may be very well, as we know ourselves, when we're engaged in our work, when we're doing that through online media, um, it's possible sometimes to just tune out and uh, be doing something else and following your social media channel or something at the same time when you're supposed to be engaged. Um, is that's, that's certainly true, that, it's, uh, that that can happen online and it happens in different ways from the way it happens in a room. So what we have to remember is if all the students are sitting in a lecture theatre in the built environment, it is also the case that it's possible for them to tune out, to be following Twitter or some other uh, social media channel um, and to not really be listening and engaged, etc. So um, there, I would say there are parallels. It's also the case, and, I'm, and there's research going on at the moment, so I'm very interested myself to see what the research that's happening now into the impact of this big shift online uh, um, will, will tell us uh, in, in a year or two's time about the pros and cons and, and the practices that we need to change in order to make the most of this new era. Um, but I think um, one of the things we, we've begun to understand already is that for some students, the online space feels much safer and much more engaging. So, for example, if you're a student who suffers from social anxiety, and many students do, um, it can be very painful to have to turn up to a room with an awful lot of people that you don't know and maybe you don't speak the same language as them and that discomfort, etc. What we have found, and some of the initial um, studies are quite interesting, I'm just seeing some emerging ideas coming from them, um, is that some students are finding they're engaging, they're making their face more visible, they're asking questions, they're answering questions online in ways that they would not have done when they were face to face. So I think there are pros and cons and we have to develop those ways of managing them. And I think practice will enable those who are teaching online to, to work out the, the right ways forward. But also once we see the research coming through more clearly, um, we'll have good uh, evidence based advice through, through that research. I think that's very interesting because I uh, read often about uh, worries uh, about the social skill, so communication and social skill development mm. in, 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 the, in the younger uh, students, at least. And, and now, yeah. Professor, you're bringing up an excellent example where it could um, uh, actually help um, overcome uh, perhaps uh, in, in some cases the fear. So um, um, we have a question from, from Adam who um, I believe uh, is in a secondary uh, school, um, um, probably one of the British schools here in Kuwait, and he's asking about um, the younger uh, pre-university students, and they have not yet become independent learners. So um, the current model of online learning, a uh, few years from now, they will be entering into the tertiary education system. What will they... Uh, lack or what challenges will they have? How would uh, universities have to adapt to this generation, uh, depending on how long they they study re remotely? But uh, um, uh, the current model. This is um, the question that Adam asks. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, again, I mean, such great questions, and it will be very interesting in two or three years' time uh, or longer. Um, God willing, when we can look back at um, at a a, uh, a time when this you know whole pandemic has passed but that we've 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 got the most of the advantages from the from the experience uh, without the disadvantages I, I i look forward to that day um I, my i think just my my initial reaction to this is that certainly uh, the examples around the connected curriculum i've seen a number of those examples um work well with students who are still in high school um what's kind of fascinating um, is that it obviously it depends on the type of educational system the students going through and that, that will vary very enormously uh, around the world um, but what often happens is that younger students um, even students in sort of primary you know first schools um, are um, are quite exploratory they they investigate they try they mix things they connect things and what we do through the school system is we kind of drum that out of them and stop them doing it. So in some ways, what, what I'd be keen to do is to, to create a more of a sort of connected through line of practices from, from very young. Uh, I have a five-year-old grandson 
and he he makes all sorts of cross connections and is always investigating something um but i what i would like is for him not to have to stop that sort of that real authentic inquiry approach um when as he goes through his schooling and and then by the time he gets to university um should that happen one day in the future um that he will be so prepared to be in that space to be thinking about what research tells us to be really uh, really inquiring across those different disciplinary um terrains um i i do know for sure i used to once teach uh, before i was in the higher education sector i used to teach 16 to 19 year olds and uh, and some of the work that i did actually around communication which is where some of my uh, some of where my ideas came from um was around situating students as kind of clients to local local um, uh, organizations and they had to develop um, communications artifacts as the clients of the local doctor's surgery or whatever it might be. And they had to understand what it meant to engage um, externally. And, and often they were very um, kind of green and, and unprepared when they started, but it's extraordinary what you can learn in a short time, especially if you put people together in small groups so that they don't feel too exposed initially. And I would love to be seeing um, more um, and this isn't instead of traditional knowledge. I don't think it's a zero sum game. It's not let's forget all this traditional knowledge and do all of this kind of creative exploratory stuff. You, you can embed core knowledge that is absolutely vital for students to know at, at different age groups into practices that are very engaging and, and exploratory. And I would love to see that uh, happen more. We've lost your sound, um, Youssef. <laughs> I said if I can, and, and I'll, I'll move slightly away from students and more towards the, the administration. I, um, I have a question uh, from, it's related to your book. Uh, when it comes to the, um, the, 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 the decoupling between the, um, uh, what we would have here, like the, the vice president of a university for research and the vice president handling academic affairs, what we would call our education, uh, and the lack of incentives for them to have uh, an overlap. W yeah. What, yeah, what, what, what advice would you have to align their interests, those two functions in the university, to align their interests yeah, for them to not you. be so mutually exclusive, for them to work together? Because this seems to be a universal problem. Yeah, it absolutely does. And you make me smile because it reminds me when I was uh, at University College London before I was at LSE, um, when I was brought into UCL uh, because I had an interest in these areas, um, almost to do that job, to say, what can we do to, um, you know, create these better connections between these different portfolios, if you like, the research and the uh, education, academic affairs. Um, and uh, in the penultimate book uh, chapter in the book, I tell the little story of what happened at UCL and how we actually went about that. And UCL adopted connected curriculum as their institutional strategy uh, up until uh, 2034, I think it was, um, which uh, would be interesting to see how long it actually goes forward. But, um, um, but uh, so they, they've really kind of built in those concepts. But one of the key things I did was to challenge the idea that we would have in the university, we would have um, one uh, source of funding that was for research and one source of funding that was around education teaching. One, mm -hmm. one committee that looks after research, a senior committee, one senior committee that looks after education. And so when I was at UCL, we created a, a committee called actually it was called the Connected Curriculum Steering Group. And we had all the key leaders in both areas or all areas really because it was also to do with public engagement uh, so it's also that outward facing connection um, and I had all the key leaders in that group and we had a kind of no holds barred exploratory creative space where everybody could say we could do this differently what would happen if the students were involved in promoting the ideas of this research to our local community how does that relate to knowledge exchange how could we get um, more funding for our research if we say to the funding um, the funding providers uh, that uh, that we're going to involve students, so we're going to be building uh, capacity for future generations, and and then you start to build these synergies. So you do have to be quite creative, but it's a really important field to focus on. And and thank you. And uh, the audience wants to go back to uh, to students, uh, the face-to-face -face engagement. Who 
let's say uh, we, we we have less than 10 minutes left but let's take two questions i think we can squeeze them in before the end of the talk um we have a question from uh, Kuwait University, uh, Dr. Sharifa, I believe she asked um, about um, recommendations to encourage face-to-face -face student engagement. Uh, cameras are optional, and I add this, it seems that ca cameras are becoming more and more optional as we are uh, congesting uh, the uh, internet bandwidth, uh, so uh, teachers are Instructors are, um, um, I think, more and more often telling students that they can turn off their cameras once they've checked in, uh, simply mm -hmm. not to clog the random. So, um, learning management systems, uh, students uh, opt out of engagement sometimes, prefer not to engage. And and the question is, um, is you, as you can see in front of you, if you wish to, it's a it's a packed question. If you wish to address one of these, um, mm -hmm. I would appreciate that. Yeah, sure. And again, it's one of the challenges that so many of us are, are facing uh, right now. Um, I'm, I'm a bit of a pragmatist myself. I sort of think, you know, when you're in a time of real challenge, then, um, then let, you know, let's try things. Let's see what works. Let's try a little bit more of something, a little bit less of something, see how it's uh, actually really sort of working for us all. Um, I think um, what's really key here is for uh, a kind of agreement um, with students when they start about what's expected of them and what where, what the parameters are, what they what's permissible and what isn't. And often, of course, there can be disagreements among faculty members or across an institution uh, about what should or shouldn't be happening. Um, should all the students be asked to take, put their cameras on? Well, that's difficulty then with bandwidth and other sorts of practical reasons and so on. Um, my, I, you know, it's not a very sophisticated answer, but I have to say that my approach is a little bit try things and see. Um, so, for example, you may agree that it, it's not going to be feasible for all of the students to have their cameras on for the whole session that you're in. But you may have a period of time when you ask, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes at the beginning or something when you ask students to have their cameras on and just to give everybody a sense of the of the uh, of the physical existence, as it were, of the of the participants in the session, and and I think um, the question was in part two around um, encouraging sort of real face to face experiences. And I mean, we are talking a lot about online, but I would still also look for those opportunities. One of the examples I look I use in the group and the book that is, has become very powerful. We're using a lot at LSE now is in something we call small peer study groups, which can be either online or face to face, where we put students into small groups of six um, and we ask them to do things in between sessions um, as well as uh, as well as uh, sometimes during sessions, perhaps in breakout groups or whatever. Um, but putting those students together in groups of six where they where they at least have their cameras on to each other and develop a more personal re relationship through those group activities, which are meaningful activities connected with their studies. So they feel it's purposeful engagement, but is this kind of subset of the community that they feel they can really um, come to terms with. There's another example that you'll find in the book. So I hope you I hope you feel that that's one example that's of interest. We, we've lost your sound again, Youssef. I said um, uh, that's very interesting. We will take one last uh, question before giving concluding remarks, and uh, and it's about um, evaluation, evaluating evaluating students. Uh, they didn't explicitly talk about um, cheating, but the, this is a question that comes up when it talks about evaluation. But at the question is at the end of this academic year for those schools, universities, secondary, tertiary doing. Uh, exclusively remote uh, education. Uh, how representative are these uh, um, scores uh, of, of the student academic level, do you think? Yeah, that's again a very good question. I, I would say, uh, so we've been through one cycle, you know, in the last academic year where all of, uh, pretty much all of the assessments were online at the end of the academic year. Um, we've had mixed um a, a mixed sense of the uh, extent to which it was either much much better or really rather difficult and it goes across the spectrum and without wishing to generalize i would say that a number of the more qualitative more textual kind of um uh, subject disciplines um 
uh, were very happy with students having open book type um, uh, assessments over a longer period of time. They didn't mind that the students weren't, you know, remembering in a short time, but that, that but what they were being asked to do was more sophisticated and more um, more nuanced uh, and more personal in some ways uh, in terms of uh, of accessing the the depth of understanding of those students. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, in areas such as um, you know mathematics or other more quantitative disciplines, um, clearly there are challenges uh, in a di in disciplines or in particular parts of disciplines at least where students would be expected to demonstrate that they can solve a particular problem, for example, in a given uh, a period of time. And so there are online solutions, online proctoring solutions that enable mm. um, enable those sorts of things to be done in that shorter period of time. But I would be telling uh, far from the truth if I said that we've got all of this uh, absolutely sewn up. But what I would say is that in principle, and speaking as an, ad an education specialist, if you like, in principle, there is no reason in logic why online assessments should, should be any less good at showing level. And, so, and it may, it's better for showing levelness and depth of sophistication, if you like, in some ways, and a little bit less good in other ways, but you can play with design, you can play with mixing modes, and hopefully get the, the best of all of those worlds. Okay, that's, um, that's reassuring. And hopefully, as we uh, weather the storm uh, and, and pass through it in hindsight, we'll know um, and will develop best practices. Uh, I'm sure that um, uh, those um, designing curriculums or designing the testing modalities uh, go through a continuous improvement uh, cycles as we go along. I think with this, uh, we will uh, conclude. Do you have any uh, final uh, uh, words uh, you can uh, leave us with, uh, Professor Fung, uh, um, based on, these, on this topic before we conclude? Well, yes, thank you. I, I think I'll just um, finish by saying thank you so much for all of the very interesting questions. Um, I really hope that the participants today or an, anyone listening in um, subsequently um, will uh, kind of think about their role and their relationship to, to knowledge and to, to the, the, the people who are developing and pushing the, the, the cutting edge of science, if you like, and, and how we can break down some of those traditional barriers between universities and the public and professions and, and um, uh, you know, politicians and policymakers and others. It's absolutely vital that we think afresh about ways in which we can come together in this very difficult period that we're all going through. Um, and break down some of those traditional barriers. And if, if part of that is about empowering our students to really be imaginative, to really understand why it's important to be, to be critically engaged with ideas, to, to really take science seriously in, in its widest possible set of definitions, um, then I think that will be a really wonderful thing. And although we're going through a difficult time now, there will be some very positive learning we can draw from it uh, eventually. And hopefully we'll be working with our students as they become alumni and, and partners in the future to make sure that we all learn uh, the very best lessons that we can from this time. Thank you so much, Professor Fung. Um, I, I can't thank you enough on behalf of the Kuwait Foundation for the Advancement of Sciences. I thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing uh, the book. I remind uh, our audience uh, that it is available for direct download uh, in the handout section of this uh, presentation. And also you can find it on UCL um, Press website. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time, Professor Fung. Uh, and hopefully uh, we will see our audience again in our next uh, KFAS Link lectures. Uh, have a good evening, everyone. Good evening.